You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 197, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Happy 2018, Mike. Yeah, we finally made it. Yeah. We are. We have crossed the line. Going to have to get used to saying 2018. It's never easy for me to switch gears, but uh, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife uh, had to redo a couple checks today because yeah. <laughs> she already forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, that's just the way it goes. What can you do? All right, Mike, real quickly, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we're calling for Hebrews questions specifically. So we're going to do a Q&A on that if we get enough uh, good questions uh, at the end of our covering of Hebrews. Uh, email me, treystrickland at gmail.com. Uh, hopefully we'll pick a few uh, that can add to the conversation of the book of Hebrews. And Mike, I guess um, with chapter 11, what do you think the over under of you saying the word faith? <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the spread uh, on you saying the word faith yeah. for chapter eleven here? Probably forty forty or so times. Yeah, I was going to say. 50. Are you going to count them? I'm going to say fifty and a half. <laughs> over under is fifty and a half. So we'll get Brenda to count them for us. We'll see. Yeah, are you, you going to take the over? Or are you going to take the under? Uh, I'll take the over. Yeah, I was going to go over. Do we need to go like sixty? No, 50 is a good number. 50, all right. 50 and a half. All right, all right, all right. I'll I'll, I'll take the under so you can take the over. How about, okay. Okay. about that? Sounds good. Yeah, well, you know, what? so do we win anything or? Oh, well, no, because you could you, you dictate who wins because if you're getting close to 50 mentally, you can stop saying it. Oh, no, I'll never I'll never be able to count that. Yeah, well, I don't know. Do you want, do we put something on the line here for this? I mean. You could dub in a sound or something. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to think of something. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could we could top that because you know it's it's Hebrews eleven. Uh, I remember uh, as a not not a new Christian, but you know fairly new. I mean, I I you know first time I read the chapter, I just thought it was awesome, and uh, this was the only really extensive passage in Scripture that I I really tried to memorize. So it's a, it's a long chapter. I, I think I got basically the whole thing. That was in the King James, though, so I, I, I'm, I'm sure I could, I, I may lapse into King James, you know, quoting part of this, uh, even though I, I use the ESV for the podcast. But you know, if if that happens, you'll know why. Uh, we're going to go through the whole chapter. I'm not going to read it all ahead of time. We're just going to start out. We'll spend a little time here in the the very first verse because it's foundational, really, the first few verses, and we'll we'll work our way through the chapter because there's something specific as we read through the chapter that I want people to be thinking about uh, that ties into the last episode uh, of, you know, our series on Hebrews. So if you listen to that, uh, I, I sort of dropped a little something at the end uh, about the nature, the, the character, the, the kind of people that wind up in Hebrews 11. And I'm going to be repeating that here. And I'm going to keep returning to the theme because I think it's an important lesson. These were not super men and super women. They were actually pretty ordinary. Uh, let's just jump in here to the first verse. Again, reading ESV. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, right away, and that's the first verse. We're going to stop there. We need to talk about faith, uh, pistis in Greek. And the context for this, you know, lo and behold, is the immediately preceding verses, which would be Hebrews 10. 35 through 39. I'm going to read those verses because when the writer jumps into now faith, you know, here in, in chapter 11, he's thinking about what he just wrote. So here's the end of Hebrews 10, verses 35 through 39. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For and then he quotes, he has a quotation here, the Old Testament. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, 
my soul has no pleasure in him. End of the quote. Then verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now, you could go back again to the end of chapter 10. We talked about these verses. Again, this it's the same thing that we've been talking about. Faith is not just sort of an intellectual assent. You know, you, you pray a little prayer, you turn the gospel into an incantation, and it's, you know, we're, we're done with that now. And I can more or less believe anything I want to from that point forward because I said the magic words. Faith is enduring. You have to believe, and yet you have to keep believing. Uh, the, the kind of faith that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, you know, the saving faith he's talking about, is not an incantation. It's something that endures, that persists, despite struggles, despite doubt, despite persecution, despite our own character flaws, despite moral failures. Because the gospel has nothing to do with achieving moral perfection or having more moral pluses than minuses. That is not the point. It's about believing and believing you know, in an enduring, tenacious way. So the faith here is of a different quality than we might be thinking about. Uh, it's more uh, as well than wishful thinking. You know, if, in other words, you know, if, if we're talking about faith and belief, we're not talking here, the writer's not talking about wishful thinking as in a sentence like, I believe the Bills can win the Super Bowl, or I believe the Bills can win the Super Bowl. In other words, it's something you hope happens, that you wish for. Okay, this is something different, because all the way through the book of Hebrews, the writer, and he's going to do it again here in this chapter, the writer has grounded faith. He uses words like belief and confidence and assurance. And he's going to do it here in the first few verses of Hebrews 11. He doesn't ground it in our wishes. He grounds it in the realities of what Jesus has done and our belief that Jesus has done what is necessary, and that's the end of the story, and that we continue in that belief. We have a believing loyalty to what Christ has done, to the cross event, and that is what salvation is about. So it's not wishful thinking. It's also not intellectual resignation, as in a sentence like, well, given no better alternative, I believe so. That's not it either. Again, it is a firm assurance that endures. This faith, to quote Hebrews 10, again, to draw on Hebrews 10, because this is what is in the writer's head when he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Okay. The, this faith doesn't shrink back, doesn't shrink back. That's the language of Hebrews 10. It doesn't shrink back from the confidence the writer has talked about to this point. In other words, the object or the basis of belief. And let's go back, you know, real quickly, Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Verse 14 of Hebrews 3, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Hebrews 10, back a little further, verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So the writer's been talking about confidence. Again, it's not confidence in our performance. It's not confidence that we have more pluses than minuses. It's not confidence that we never have any questions, or we don't get angry at God, or we don't question what God is doing. We're going to do that, of course, because, you know, newsflash, we aren't God. We're also not omniscient. We don't know everything that's going on or what God intends. Okay, none of these things are, are what this is about. This kind of faith is a tenacity. It's a persistence, a persistent belief, a persistent believing loyalty in what Jesus has done at the cross event. And then that becomes the basis for confidence, not something we've done, not something we've talked ourselves into, not something we wish, not something we sort of resign ourselves to because we can't see a better alternative. Okay? It is confidence in something done for us, not something we do or that's something we can even understand in terms of it 
clearing out struggle and frustration. So it's a not shrinking back. That's the quality that's characteristic of all the examples that follow. And this is what I want people to latch on to in this episode. The hall of faith, as Hebrews 11 is called. All of the people in this example, or in, the, in this, that, that are listed as examples in this chapter, they all have one thing in common. Well, they have more than one thing in common, they, except for Enoch, because he's, you know, he's taken off earth, okay? They all have struggles. They all, they, had, they, they were suffering. They had moral lapses, a number of them. They had lapses in judgment, again, a number of them. But they're still here. They're still in this list. Again, it, it wasn't about the perfection of their performance or that their performance was mostly good and, and less bad. What they, what they share at the end of the day, the reason they're in, is that their faith persisted. They never sh- shrank back. They never forsook their faith. They never forsook their believing loyalty in the promises of God and what God was doing, not with, you know, as opposed to what they were doing. So they're not examples, to put it negatively. The people listed in Hebrews 11 are not examples of never having a problem, never making a bad decision, never sinning. Quite the contrary. They are examples of positively never trading in their faith, never worshiping another god or no god at all. And they maintain belief despite life, despite persecution, doubt, and their own failure. So to go back to Hebrews 11.1, again, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Assurance here, interestingly enough, and building on what I just said, is the same word as confidence in one of the verses we just read, Hebrews 3.14. It's the same word. And again, interestingly enough, it's the same word that occurs in Hebrews 1.3, which we didn't read and I'll read now. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The word here, again, for assurance in Hebrews 11, one is hypostasis. Same as in Hebrews 3, 14, where it's translated confidence. Here, it's the idea of Jesus in, in a qualitative sense, okay, Jesus is the sort of exact representation. Uh, again, it, it's a little hard to capture in the wording because confidence doesn't really work. Again, he is the imprint. Jesus is the imprint of God's hypostasis, God's nature. Well, God's reality. Jesus is the the exact you know, imprint of, of the reality of God is really what, what the term is used to convey there in Hebrews chapter 1. So recalling all that, Jesus is the sort of the objective reality of the glory of God, of the nature of God, the character of God. And by using this term, hypostasis, in Hebrews 1 about Jesus, again, being the objective reality of, of, of God, by using the, the word there and then using it here in Hebrews 11, I mean, he ties the two thoughts together. He ties, you know, Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 11. Hebrews 1 is about Jesus. Hebrews 11 is about, you know, the, the faith of our assurance of things hoped for, which, of course, is grounded in Jesus. So by using the term in both places, the writer wants us to see that the object of our faith is an objective reality whose name was Jesus. And that is why we should be confident. And that is the thing that is the object of our faith. That's the source of our confidence and our assurance. Again, not our performance, but on what Jesus, who is the, again, the exact imprint, the objective reality of God to us, what he did, not what we do, but what he did, again, at the cross event. A Luke Timothy Johnson in his commentary has a, a little thing in it here about, about this that I want to I want to read tying in uh, Hebrews 11 and, you know, with this thought and, and, and even what follows in Hebrews 12. He says, the heroes of faith are here presented, are precisely the models that we are to imitate, culminating in the pioneer and perfecter of faith, Jesus himself. So if we think about this, let's just think about Hebrews 1 through 11 in terms of chapters. It begins with Jesus as the hypostasis, the objective reality of God 
to us, to humankind. And because of what that person, what Jesus does, and we've talked about incarnation a lot. Hebrews talks about incarnation a lot. We've talked about Jesus' role as high priest. We've talked about the cross. But because of what this person did, this person who is the objective reality of God and God's will and what God wants and, and the salvation God offers, all of that, then we can have confidence. Again, it's the same term. You know, it just gets translated in different ways. There's this objective thing. There's this thing that's real. And so the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 is saying now, our faith is a thing that's real because the object of it is real. It, it was Jesus who did this, this stuff on the cross. And he ties the two things together. But interestingly enough, if we think about the chapters 1 through 11, it begins with Jesus, incarnation, priesthood, all this kind of stuff. Again, the objective reality of, of, of the cross event. And you get up here to chapter 11, then we have examples of people refusing to shrink back from that confidence. They're refusing to shrink back from believing loyalty in the cross event. In other words, they're refusing to worship any other god or no god at all. Believing loyalty. Again, that's the phrase I use in Unseen Realm, and I use it a lot here on the podcast. That is what salvation is, believing loyalty. It's not believing performance. It's not believing doubtlessness, you never having a question-ness, if that's a word, and of course it's not. It's believing loyalty. It's saying this is the means of salvation and there is no other, and this is where I'm at, come what may. And that's what it's about. And, and it's interesting, again, you, you, go, you go through all those 11 chapters, and then you, you hit chapter 12, as Luke Timothy Johnson just said. And what is the writer right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which, which clings in us to us so closely, so on and so forth, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. It goes right back to him. Again, he's the basis for the whole thing. Now, back to verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, when a, you know, Lane has a nice uh, comment here. This is from the Word Biblical Commentary. He writes, the second clause this notion of the conviction of things not seen, which stands in opposition to the first, is equally daring. Faith demonstrates the existence of reality that cannot be perceived through objective sense perception as the complement to hypostasis, reality, again, this objective reality. This word conviction, it's translated conviction, elenkos in Greek. This word elenkos must be understood in the objective sense of proof or demonstration, the evidential character that deprives uncertainty of any basis. Okay, why do we have this assurance? Because our faith is in an objective reality, the objective reality that, that, that is God to humanity, that's Jesus, and the objective reality of what was done at the cross. Okay, the death, burial, and of course, then the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And again, Hebrews talks about all these things. Especially, you know, resurrection and ascension there in chapter one, having, you know, made it, you know, made himself an offering, you know, for sin, he, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, that, that phrasing has occurred several times in the book of Hebrews. So, again, this is not a wishful thought. It's not a resignation. It's a confidence in something done for us that basically it was God's plan. Jesus did it, and that's good enough. Again, not a performance-based sort of system, way of looking at things. Now, Luke Timothy Johnson comments again, going back to his commentary, and he's going to comment on uh, this term that, that Lane just did, this elenkos, a term. This is the only time in the New Testament where that particular term occurs. Uh, so it, it gets some attention from scholars. And Luke Timothy Johnson has this to say about it. He says, this is the only occurrence of the noun in the New Testament. In the wider Greek world, the noun has two, many, two meanings. The first is the same as the verb form elenkain that is used in the New Testament in other places, in the sense of reproof or reproach. And he cites you know, Homer and the Odyssey, and again, classical world. It's not an unfamiliar verb. This clearly cannot be the meaning here, the second meaning of the Greek noun is an argument of disputation or refutation through cross-examination. And he has a bunch of citations. But it can also be used in the sense of a proof or a demonstration. 
or even for evidence used in proof, like, you know, a, sort of a legal kind of argument. So Jesus is both the objective reality of God and the objective proof of that reality. Jesus is both, again, the object, the basis of the faith, and he's the, he's the evidence for the faith. And it all goes back to the cross event. It has nothing to do, none of these terms have anything to do with human performance. Just period. It's not even in the picture. It's not even on the radar. But yet for us and for so many Christians, you know, it, it is. That, that this, is, this is how we think about salvation. You know, yeah, I prayed a prayer, but now I, I've fallen into sin. I, I, need to, I need to stop, you know, doing that so either so that God can give me my salvation back, again, we, assuming that we lost it because of our moral imperfection, again, which again has, is, is to misunderstand the gospel. Or, well, I know, I, I know God didn't take it away, but I, I, need to, I need to do this, that, or the other thing so God is, you know, still loves me like he did before, or you can keep God happy with me. You know, usually when it, when it gets to that kind of talk, it's not repenting of sin. It's like doing works. I need to observe these particular days. I need to, you know, read my Bible X number of minutes. I need to be in church X number of minutes. I need to do, 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 do to keep God happy with me. And that is a complete misunderstanding, not only of the gospel, but of, of the nature of God. Your performance, your, your activity, your behavior, your, your busyness isn't what gives God a loving disposition toward you. Because God had that while we were yet sinners. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense, but this is where our mind drifts all the time. Now, as we go through these examples, again, just those are preliminary, you know, comments. Now, faith, I'll just read, you know, the f first few verses again, because we're going to get into actual examples here. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen it was not made out of things that are visible. Again, we're not gonna we're not gonna lapse into verse three. We've talked a little bit about the the, the universe word there in verse three back in actually in Hebrews one, that it could be plural and plural worlds and all that stuff. If you want if you're interested in that, you know, rabbit trail, you can go back there. But we're gonna just jump into the actual examples because this is what I want the takeaway to be from this episode. As we go through the rest of the chapter, notice how one or more of the following items applies to each person. Suffering, moral failure, and doubt. Okay, I'll read it again. As we go through the chapter, notice how one or more of these items are going to apply to the, each person listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. Suffering, moral failure, and doubt. Again, there's only one exception, that's Enoch, because he was taken, and really we have next to nothing said about him. But the, you're going to find with everybody else, somewhere in their life, somewhere in the biblical story, you're going to have one, of, one or more of those three things. You're also going to, again, as you're familiar with it, with these personalities, you're also going to notice that giving up the faith applies to none of them, because that's what this is about. Okay, it's about believing loyalty. So jumping into verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And he suffered for doing the right thing, for believing the right thing, for you know, honoring God, believing whatever it was that God told them to do. Again, we're not given much information in Genesis 4, but Abel's heart again his you know the reason that he did what he did and, and did it in a certain way was you know acceptable to god again we're not told about any conversation related to sacrifice we're just not given information way back in genesis but his sacrifice was acceptable and cain's was not and he suffers for it you know we don't have in the in the biblical story and we certainly don't have any indication here that you know when abel you know came under attack that all of a sudden you know he 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 changed his believing loyalty. No, that again that's just not part of the story. And again, based on Hebrews eleven here, that that's that didn't happen. He endured. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, 
it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, you notice here, faith and pleasing God are connected, and pleasing God is also in turn connected with the idea of drawing near to God and seeking God. So pleasing God has something to do in this context with having a relationship. Now, that's important because this passage has been taken by some as an indication that, you know, we're going to talk about lost people here, people who are, you know, outside of Christ, who, don't, who aren't believers. Th this, this verse has been taken by some as an indication that lost people can never please God, ever, 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 that everything a lost person does draws the wrath of God or turns it up a notch. Now, that is also tied to a certain view of depravity. And, and if you think I'm, I'm caricaturing things, let me read you a quotation here. Uh, this is from Raymond's Systematic Theology, and he comes from the Reformed tradition. He writes, because man is totally or perversely, pervasively corrupt, he is incapable of changing his character or of acting in a way that is distinct from his corruption. He is unable to discern, to love, or to choose the things that are pleasing to God. Well, you know, if we're talking about doing something, thinking that you're going to merit God's favor, well, of course, God's not going to be happy with that. But this notion that a lost person can't do anything that God would approve of is, I think, nonsense. And I'm going to quote here from a, a section of my 60-second scholar book, a book three, a little entry on this. And again, it, you know, please don't you know, send me emails about, where, why, why can't I get the 60-second scholar books? You, know, you can find it, Google it, uh, or, or search on my website, and you'll find out what's going on with the series. The series will be re-released in May. But I wrote this. Several verses are offered to support this contention, again, this idea that a lost person can never please God, most notably Romans 8, 7, and 8. Quote, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay? Unquote. The problem is that this idea and its understanding of passages like Romans 8, 7, and 8 is flatly contradicted by other passages. Acts 10, the story of the conversion of the Gentile Cornelius, is perhaps the best case in point. Cornelius was a, quote, God-fearer, a man who respected Judaism and its God, but who nevertheless had never heard the gospel. When Peter heard how Cornelius was visited by an angel who commanded him to summon the apostle to his home, Peter exclaimed, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I guess, you know, Peter hadn't read Romans 8 or, you know, or Raymond's systematic theology. Back to, the, to, to my selection here. The passage is clear. While no one can please God in the sense of meriting salvation, unsaved people can please God. They can do things that are acceptable to God. Paul said the same thing in Romans 2.14. Paul's the guy who wrote Romans 8, by the way. He, wrote the same, he said this in Romans 2.14, that Gentiles not possessing God's law nevertheless at times do what's in the law. It's incoherent to think that a Gentile who lives in accord with God's law at any given moment is displeasing God by doing so. The point of Romans 8, 7, and 8 is to contrast those controlled by the Spirit versus the flesh with respect to lifestyle and being a child of God. It's not that unbelievers can never do anything that pleases God. Cornelius shows us otherwise. Again, I would suggest to you that the lost person who refuses to cheat on his wife and, and is thinking, well, I, you know, they may not understand the gospel, may not believe it, but they're thinking, well, you know, I, I agree with you know, that, that Ten Commandments stuff. And I just don't think I should cheat on my wife. And, I, and, and if, if there is a God, I think you know, that, that this is a good point. So I'm not going to cheat on my wife. And so God looks at that and says, oh, I'm even angrier. Again, you know, we understand that, that, that a works mentality to try to cajole God into giving you salvation, God's not going to approve of that. He's not going to be happy with it. But when the Gentiles do the things that are written in the law because they have the law of God written on their hearts, God isn't angry when people follow his rules for righteousness and justice. It's just they're not going to take your – they're not going to solve the sin problem. They're not going to close the gap between – you know you, that, 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 that is there because of your estrangement from God. You don't work your way to heaven. And that's clear. But you know God is honored. When people who don't even have the law do it because they have this law of God written on their hearts, God likes when people obey him. But again, he knows that if they're thinking that, well, when I obey God, God's going to have to give me something in return. Okay, that, that, that's going to that's irritate God. 
But that's not what every situation is. Every situation doesn't devolve into that. Well, let's go back again and think about what do we mean by pleasing God, making God happy? Do we mean, you know, what, what do we mean by that? Do we mean to produce agreement or satisfaction? When, when the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, what, what's going on here? And without faith, it's impossible to make God happy. And what, what would that even mean? Does, does, what, what's happiness? Do we mean to produce agreement or satisfaction, to gratify? Without faith, it's, it's impossible to, to get God to gleefully accept a person as though there's nothing wrong with their relationship. I mean, what, what do we mean by happiness? What do we mean by pleasing? Now, again, I would, I would say God would certainly you know, agree with a lost person's decision to follow the law of God. He'd be gratified. He'd be glad. But that doesn't mean the act of obedience solves the problem of right relationship. Again, relationship is what's really you know, being talked about in this passage in, in you know, verse 6. You, know, you have to believe that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And it's about having the relationship. This is what God really wants. Again, God, you know, it doesn't mean that God is, is pleased, you know, so pleased that anyone who's earned salvation you know, or does a good thing you know, gets into heaven by doing a particular good thing. That just isn't what, what the picture is. I would suggest this. Why don't we define pleasing God here, God's happiness, as a state of being content? Okay, without faith, it's impossible to have God be content. You know, th- thinking of ha- think of happiness and, and being pleased in the, in the sense of being content. Without believing, it's just not possible to, to make God satisfied, to make God happy in the sense of being content. Why? Because what he wants most of all is for you to believe. That's what he wants most from every person. He wants a relationship, and the relationship hinges upon faith, belief. So yeah, without faith, it really is impossible for God to be content, for God to be you know, happy in that sense of, of fulfillment, that everything's okay now. That requires faith. God can, can look at a lost person and say, well, you know, yep, I'm glad you didn't cheat on your wife. I'm glad you didn't do X, Y, Z, because th- this shows that, that, that you're, you have a sense of, of my justice. Even if you don't have the law of God, it's written on your heart. You know, right from wrong. And this, this is sort of something I've woven into the fabric of the world, okay? When, when God sees someone doing the right thing and living according to his you know, principles of justice and righteousness, God isn't, isn't angry when people obey him. But it doesn't, it doesn't fill God up. God is still empty if there's no relationship, if we can put it that way. God is still not happy. He's still not content because there's no relationship. For that, you need faith. You need, you need believing loyalty. I think that's what the point of the passage is. Now, to get back to our examples, you know, continuing on into verse 7. Again, think of, as we go through these again, notice how one or more of these items applies to each person, suffering, moral failure, or debt. We're up to Noah now, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now you notice Noah's believing loyalty there is a precursor to the flood. It's pre-flood. Noah isn't, uh, you know, he doesn't have perfect moral, you know, character thereafter. You know, we have the, the, the episode with drunkenness uh, in Genesis nine. Does that invalidate his faith? Does it disqualify him? No, he's still in Hebrews eleven. Can his moral imperfection? isn't the issue. It's his believing loyalty, his faith, that's the issue. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, you think he had questions? Okay. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham, perfect moral, upright character here. Okay, They have the whole incident with Hagar. 
you know, he, he decides that, that he wants to, you know, redefine or, or maybe, you know, second guess or maybe, you know, take matters into his own hands about fulfilling the promise of God, he goofs, he blows it. God has to rebuke him. Okay. Sarah, Sarah doesn't, doesn't believe she's going to have in Genesis 18. She laughs when she hears it, but she came around. She came around. She understood. And she's in, in Hebrews 11 as well. I mean, both of them, Abraham lies, you know, you know, about Sarah being his half sister and so on. You know, he shades the truth. He lies. You know, he, he does these things. He, he puts his own, you know, he makes his own contribution to God's plan and, and messes that up. But none of these things are the issue. Okay? None of those things are the issue. The issue is their believing loyalty. They didn't throw their faith, throw their believing loyalty to some other deity or no God at all. They believed, even when it was hard. In okay, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did not receive him back. Or he did receive him back. Now, you know, let, let's just stop here. I mean, Abraham is tested by God, you know, with, with the whole episode of, of offering up Isaac there in Genesis 22. And the comment is made here that you know, he considered that God was able to raise him up from the dead. Now, for sure, you know, do you, do you think, does the passage say that Abraham or Abram, you know, Abraham, Abraham, Abram, same, same person, obviously, did, uh, you know, do we presume that, that Abraham never like had a question, never had a doubt, like, well, what's God going to do? You know, like, man, if I, if I offer up Isaac, how does that work? Because it's through Isaac. I mean, God told me it's through Isaac that all these descendants, the, the, you know, as the stars of the sky, back to the original covenant promise, that, that all of that's going to come from Isaac. And I know it's Isaac and nobody else because I, I messed up with Hagar and God had to you know, call me on the carpet for that. That Isaac was the, the the child of promise. So if I kill him, like, how does that work? I mean, if you don't think Abraham ever even at last or at least asked that question, how does this work? You know, I, I think you're deluding yourself. And again, this is an unbelief. Having questions, having uncertainties, is not unbelief. Okay, the, the writer of Hebrews has told us consistently how he defines unbelief, and that is bagging it, going somewhere else. Turning to another God or no God at all, just saying, I do not believe. You know, the, 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 the operative words aren't, I have a question or I don't understand. I'm just not sure. Those are all different than saying, I don't believe this. Again, the issue is, at the end of the day, do you believe? And we, we could rabbit trail here a little bit. I think it is a little bit worth it. You know, is this discernible from the Old Testament account, this whole idea of Abraham not really – you can't really say figuring it out, but sort of presuming that, well, you know, I, I'm going to go through with this because even if I kill him, even if I offer up Isaac, you know, God has to be faithful to this promise, so I guess God will bring him back from the dead. To, to me, that, that, that's not, you know, a, a stretch. I, it, we, we can't look back on the Old Testament account and say – that, you know, there, there's something, you know, cryptically there that, you know, we're, we're going to be able to figure this out, that Abraham, you know, was, was certain. Here's what you can't say, that Abraham was certain he knew how this was going to turn out. But he did believe that what God had said, God pro God's promises, that God would deliver. He, he could have reasoned that God would raise up Isaac after he was dead. I mean, after all, God had produced Isaac supernaturally in the first place. And Isaac was to be the means by which the original covenant promises were fulfilled, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So I don't think Abraham would, you know, would necessarily have, have known exactly what, what, what was going to happen here or how God would do it, but I do believe that he believed God would do something to keep his promise. I think that's what, what the writer of Hebrews is alluding to. 
Now, if you go back to Genesis 22, I, I would also say that I don't think Abraham was lying to the servant in Genesis 22.5. Now, if you remember the scene, they get to the place where the, this, the sacrifice is going to occur, and we read this in verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, you know, his servants there, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. All the verbs there are plural. I and the boy, we will go over there, we will worship, and we will come again to you. Again, it hints at Abraham believing that God would do something here. Now, we don't necessarily, you know, we can't really necessarily say Abraham had this whole thing figured out. You know, I would think he had questions, obviously, but he believed God would make it good. And, and if you think about it, that's really a great illustration of what the writer of Hebrews is asking his readers, his hearers to do. You're going to have questions. In Abraham's case, he also had moral failures. You know, you're, th this is just reality. This is life. But believe. Just believe. Believe God will do what he said he would do. And in the, and in, in the case of, of the context of, of the, the book of Hebrews, what God said he would do is that he would give you eternal life. He would make you part of his family. This is go, goes back to Hebrews 1 and 2. He would make you part of his family on the basis of what happened to Jesus at the cross and his resurrection, his ascension, to complete the job, to complete the task. So what we're asked to believe is that God was satisfied with Jesus doing what he told Jesus to do, actually what he and Jesus had agreed to do. You know, back to Hebrews 10 from last episode. That's the basis for our confidence. Again, it's not in what we do. It's what's done for us. Back to verse 20. Again, be thinking about each one of these characters, suffering, moral failure, doubt. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. I mean, do you think Isaac and Jacob never had questions, never had doubts about what was going on? I mean, look at the whole Joseph situation, the whole story there. You know, the the basically the – what do you think Isaac is thinking with, with, with the way Jacob and Esau treat – you know, Jacob treats Esau, the, the, that whole thing deteriorates. You know, just sort of their, their relationship with each other just burns up in flames in front of his eyes. You know, Esau wants to kill him. Rachel has to send Jacob away. I mean, it, it's a chaotic household. I mean, I'm sure he's, you know, Isaac's thinking, well, good grief. This isn't, this doesn't look real good here. Like, like I, I didn't figure that this is going to be the way things turned out. We're following you know, the true God here. Why isn't life better? Again, it, it's very natural, you know, to, for these things to, for, for life to just get in the way. You know, Joseph, again, suffered, you know, terribly, but he never turned his believing loyalty to anybody else, to any other God or no God at all. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, I mean, we talk about, again, someone with moral failure, you know, Moses, I mean, I guess superseded therein only by David, but I mean, Moses has lots of problems. By faith, Moses, when he was born was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Ah, so he has some sense of who he is, what his heritage is. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. In other words, he'd figured that out before he killed the Egyptian. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth a greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, because that was certainly justified. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch him. Oh, he's, he just sounds spectacular, doesn't he? He's a murderer. Okay, when God calls him, he hems and haws endlessly about it. He doesn't believe, you know, that, that God, you know, he, he, he makes all sorts of excuses about why he's not the one, why he can't do this, why he can't do that. I need help. I mean, he's a whiner. Okay. He, he, he's, a, he's sort of a faithless whiner when it comes to this particular task. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he goes. He believes that, that, that God will do what he, what he said he'd do. Now, it, it helps, and God condescends to him. We had a whole episode on this about the Melchizedek priesthood and God you know, using, 
you know, giving Moses Aaron as a concession, again, to help Moses out. You know, God is gracious to him. You know, again, we're not going to rehearse all that territory. But at the end of the day, Moses says, okay, got it. You know, we're good now. God gave me some help. I, I, I you know, we can do this. You know, God's going to be with us. You know, at the end of the day, he does believe. And then when he sees God work, you know, his faith, you know, gets stronger. I mean, he, 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 he doesn't, he's not just stuck in that whole, you know, problem of doubt, but he goes through it. He goes through it. And lo and behold, he winds up in Hebrews 11. Now, th this line about he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt has drawn a lot of attention because, you know, we don't, we don't get words like, you know, Christos in the Old Testament Christ. We get Mashiach, but we don't get that, that vocabulary anywhere in Exodus in the Moses story. So it looks like, you know, again, it looks like, it looks like the New Testament writer is intentionally you know, tying Jesus you know, to the whole situation. That probably uh, is a bit of an overstatement here, because this this idea of considering the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt that refers to Moses' disposition, his decision before the Sinai event, before the burning bush. So this likely is not an, an allusion to some second power, second Yahweh figure encounter. Uh, again, because of the chronology of of what we're dealing with here, uh, Hagner. I, I like the way Hagner sort of approaches this and the way he summarizes it. He writes this. He says, the reference to Christ is an anachronism explained by the final clause of verse 26, quote, for he was looking to the reward, unquote. As we have repeatedly seen, an essential quality of having faith is being motivated by the future and the unseen and believing that it's going to be real. That's my interjection here. Back to Hagner. The basis for the anachronistic statement is located in the unity of salvation history and the unity of God's people. When Moses suffered reproach because he was loyal to God's people, in verse 25, he, in effect, he suffered reproach for being loyal to God's Messiah, who is closely identified with God's people. The anachronism very deliberately has the readers in mind, since they are the ones called by their faithfulness to bear the reproach of Christ in this epistle. The reward that Moses would enjoy in the future and that he counted upon in his faith was far greater than the treasure Egypt had to offer. Now, again, that's just another way of saying that, that the anachronism here is deliberate on the part of the writer, because the, again, the writer wants to connect loyalty to God, loyalty to God's people, which, of course, is certainly characteristic of, of what you know, Moses was about. He wants to connect all that with the Messiah, because the Messiah was a represent, representative of God's people, the Messiah was the collect, you know, was the individual son of the collective son of God, which was Israel. And all these themes, if you've read Unseen Realm, some of this should be familiar to you. But the writer wants to connect the these associations with Messiah to Moses, and then for for his readers again, that's going to matter because they're the ones being called upon to essentially behave like Moses did to consider the reproach of Christ, to consider their faith decision, lead, that it will lead to something superior, something better than the world has to offer, and even more importantly, something better than any other god has to offer, or no god at all. In other words, it's, we're back to the same theme of tenaciously believing, and Moses becomes a, an example of that. Back to verse 29. Again, be thinking, how do, how do these things apply to each person? Suffering, moral failure, doubt. Here's a good one, verse 29. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. Hey, think about <laughs> think about how many times the Israelites complained and moaned and whined. But again, when God opens up the sea, when he parts the waters, they do go through. You know, they, they, they believe. They, they see it. They believe it. They put their lives on the line to, to do – I mean, because they could, they could be thinking, oh, boy, we go in here and what's going to happen to it? You know, they do it. They believe. By faith, the people cross the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Do you think any of the Israelites there going around the city you know, in, in their little you know, parade – are wondering, what in the world is God going to do? Do you think they ever had a question? Now, they're doing, by faith, what God asked them to do. They are believing. They're not stopping halfway through and thinking, oh, that's kind of silly. You know, if we had a better God, we wouldn't be doing ridiculous stuff like that. They're not thinking that. They believe. 
that God will do something in response to his own promise that he would. They believe there's something to it. So by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, moral failure, okay? I mean, she, you know, she's not a believer initially. She's a Canaanite. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And we, we could go back to the Jericho story, you know, and, and it's very clear that Rahab, you know, is, is in the party, the very small party that believes this is the true God. Okay, we've heard about what, what's going on here, you know, what, what happened to the Egyptians. We've heard about that. And she's like, I want to be on the side of, of that God. That God is God. Okay, that's why she's here. She, she, she shows her faith by welcoming the spies. Okay, she doesn't earn salvation by not reporting the, the, the two Israelite spies. God doesn't look at her and say, oh, you, oh, you're in, you're just over the hump there. That was a good performance, so I'm going to give you eternal life. No, no. She, what she does illustrates the fact that she believes. It shows what she believes. She believes that, that, that the power here is with this God. Any God who can do this is, is God. So that's why she's in Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say, the writer says. Oh, here we get a good, good, good bunch of you know, characters. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Doubt, please. Okay, again, how many times did, did this guy doubt? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Barak. He wasn't like the, the, you know, the pinnacle of courage. Okay, he had, he had some problems with that. He had some problems. He had some doubts there. Gideon, Barak, Samson, hello, moral judgment. Jephthah, I mean, here's another screw up. You know, he winds up, you know, sacrificing his daughter because he's a theological idiot. Okay. You know, he, he's not a theologian. Let's just put it that way. Jephthah is not the guy you go to with your, with your theological questions. He, he just, he, he, he's a screw up. Okay. I mean, he, he has, he's got some good qualities, but you know, having his having all his theological ducks in a row is not one of them, okay? But he knows where his believing loyalty is. He knows which God he has aligned himself with, and he's not budging. He doesn't know a whole lot, but he's not moving. Yep, time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David. Again, you know, fill in the blank with, with David's offenses. Samuel and the prophets. Again. That there, there are issues of suffering there. You could say there are issues of moral judgment on Samuel's part because his kids are so awful. Again, we, you have to read between the lines there, but the scripture does make the notation that Samuel, his, his sons were evil. Samuel does get scared when God tells him in 1 Samuel 16, you know, to go anoint David. This is when, you know, God has to come up with a ruse, you know, for Samuel, you know, for Samuel's sake to, uh, you know, put his fears at ease. First Samuel 16. Uh, again, these aren't perfect people. The prophets, again, you know, you, you could you could spot problems and, and and again questions, doubts, you know, suffering certainly with the prophets. You get the whole list, verse 33, all of these people who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. You think this list doesn't mean something to, the, to his, his readers and his listeners? This is the diaspora. Okay, they're scattered. They are under persecution. This is exactly what they need to hear. Okay, they suffered mocking and flogging, chains, imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Oh, I'd love to hear somebody in the prosperity gospel circle preach this passage. Oh, they just didn't have enough faith. Pardon me, but this is Hebrews 11. They had enough faith. They had the faith that mattered. 
They had the faith that leads to eternal life, not that leads to gullibility so that you can be manipulated. Okay. You know, again, these people, they, they are not superhuman beings. They suffer like people suffer, people today. When these things are happening to them, it hurt. They could bleed. They could die. They got hungry. Again, they're not superhuman beings. Of course, they would have had questions. Of course, they would ask with Job, where are you, God? Why, you know, why is this happening to me? I mean, look at Elijah. I mean, good grief. He, you know, he, he, he does, he turns around, he goes from one miracle, then he's running away from Jezebel. Like, like, where's your head at? He gets scared. He worries. He has a question. Okay, but, but, but he never gives up. He never, to use the language of Hebrews 10, he never shrinks back from his faith. He does things that are less than admirable, but he never trades it in. He never bags it. And that's the whole point of the chapter. And you get to the end here in verse 39, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us. I mean, that, 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 two important words, for us. God had provided something better for us. Again, do you think his, his hearers, his listeners need to hear that? They need, they need to have to sink into their heads, of course. God provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now, again, I, I like the way you know Hagner puts this. I'm going to read, and Lane, I'm going to read you two excerpts here because I, I like the way they express this connection between the old the, the people in Hebrews 11 from the Old Testament who who all you know are commended for their faith but they never receive what is promised because God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should not be made perfect we're connected to them okay? and, and and this had something to do with, again with 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 a plan of God God had something in you know going on here in, in his mind so Hagner writes this as wonderful as God's work was in the past it pales in comparison with what God now has done in Christ. We have reached a new stage in the history of salvation. This is modest, modestly expressed as something better for us, verse 40. We have repeatedly seen the word better in Hebrews used to describe the advantages of the new covenant over the old. Let me stop there and, and just again editorially say, hey, if it's better, then you should want that instead of Again, the thing that isn't as good. Back to the quote here. Old covenant saints and new covenant saints have the same inheritance. Okay, old covenant saints and new covenant saints have the same inheritance. I'm sorry if that offends your eschatology, you know, like two peoples of God and all that kind of stuff, because that that is a frankly a bogus idea. But Hagner's correct here and, and he's basing it off the, these, the comments here in these two verses. Old covenant saints and new covenant saints have the same inheritance. The result is that those of the past cannot be brought to the ultimate goal, quote, to be made perfect, apart from us. In the grand story of salvation, all will come together to enjoy one great final and perfect salvation, perfectly realized. This will be the reward of those who believed and who expressed their faith thereby giving faith substance and providing evidence of the unseen and of the things yet to come. Again, to, to anyone watching, anyone paying attention, that's Hagner. Now, Lane puts it this way, these last two verses. In its context, verse 40 places the emphasis on the final realization of the relationship with God. The writer has argued that the sacrifice of Christ secured all that is necessary for the enjoyment of the eschatological blessing of perfection a definitive putting away of sin, consecration to the service of God, and glorification. Okay, Christ has secured all of that. That's what's necessary, okay? Back to the quotation. It is therefore clear that the perfecting of faithful men and women under the old covenant depended upon the sacrificial death of Jesus. The promised eternal inheritance that was offered to them has become attainable only by virtue of Christ's sacrifice. The exemplary witnesses of the Old Covenant were denied the historical experience of the Messianic perfection as a totality. But now that Christ has accomplished his high priestly ministry, they too 
will share in its blessings. It's the end of the section. Now, don't miss the point. The overall point, again, the takeaway here as we close, don't miss the takeaway point. The hall of faith isn't filled with supermen and superwomen. They suffered, they had doubts, they had moments of weakness, moral failures and whatnot, but they never shrank back from believing. That's why they're there. They believed in spite of their circumstances, which is what the writer of Hebrews hopes for his hearers and his readers. The goal isn't that they perform better, it's that they keep believing. Mike, I don't know how we can say it any clearer than that. Faith is faith. And, uh, you know, with all the science and technology that we have today and, and people trying to merge the two, you know, faith <laughs> is faith. It is what it is. Right. It's not performance. It's not omniscience. It's not having the answer to every question. <laughs> and you know, it, it yeah. is what it is. Yeah. It's not having all the answers. It's, that's why it's faith. And, uh, uh, it is what it is, but, um, all right, Mike, well, I think you went over, uh, on the 50 and a half. Uh, <laughs> so, so you want, uh, maybe we'll, we'll find out. We'll, was, we'll look for Brenda to be the referee <laughs> there. There you go. <laughs> all right, Mike. Well, uh, that was a good one. And, uh, we're getting close to the end of Hebrews and then, uh, we'll have our 200th episode and then we'll have some single topics. And then shortly after that, we'll vote on the next book. I'm curious to see what it may be. Hopefully we'll stay in the New Testament, but maybe we'll journey back into the old and along Jeremiah. I bet Jeremiah wins, Mike. I don't know. I'm going to predict it. <laughs> um, well, we could change some things up, too, and throw some, some other things in there. You never know. Yeah, that's true. We could. All right, Mike. Well, chapter 12 next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.